Uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone. So welcome to uh, the first of a two traditional science sessions that we're gonna have at this meeting. Um, <clears throat> the first one is meant to highlight new approaches for analyzing air seek data, um, as well as some new insights into non-human B and T cell biology that such data can provide. Our first speaker today is Evelyn Georgiev, and he's an associate professor of pathology, microbiology, and immunology, as well as computer science at Vanderbilt University. Um, he's a faculty member, member of the Vanderbilt Vaccine Center, um, and he's director of their computational and um, microbiology and immunology program. So his lab works uh, to utilize the power of computational approaches to increase our understanding of fundamental questions in immunology and virology. And today he's going to talk to us uh, about an approach called LibreSeq, which is a high throughput mapping technique uh, for B cell receptor sequences and antigen specificity. So with that, I will turn it over to Evelyn. It, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you for the invitation to present our work on high throughput mapping of antibody sequence to antigen specificity. So uh, I will start with a brief uh, motivation behind our efforts to develop this new technology called LibreSeq. This is a little bit of an approximation and an oversimplification. And so I hope nobody will get mad with um, this introduction here, but it's just to give you an idea about what motivated us to start thinking about this problem. And so when we look at um, B cell receptor sequencing in particular, there are several different approaches that can be used and different combinations of these approaches um, that can be uh, evaluated on several different axes. Uh, these axes can be uh, along the lines of how many B cells we can get, um, information for how many B cells we can get from a sequencing experiment, whether we get paired heavy light chain sequencing information, um, whether we get antigen specificity information from the sequencing data, and how many antigens we can evaluate at a time. And there are several different approaches, as I said, there's non-paired uh, next generation sequencing, paired next generation sequencing, antigen specific sorting, which is a low throughput um, method, of course, but then you can pair that with uh, NGS and you get um, you know, benefits from, from doing both at the same time. And there are several other approaches, as I mentioned. So a lot of these approaches are limited in the number of B cells that can be generated. Um, Non-paired NGS provides the greatest depth um, and then paired NGS, especially in the last couple of years, has really uh, started playing a major role um, in, in this field. Um, they provide paired heavy light chain sequences, um, but with a lot of these approaches, with all of these approaches, the problem lies um, on the side of the antigen specificity. And so with antibodies, we are typically interested in identifying antigen specific antibodies toward antigens of target, uh, uh, target antigens of interest. But with most of these approaches, we only get either no antigen specificity information or we can only get um, antigen specificity information for a small number of antigens at a time. And mostly that's due to intrinsic limitations of the, the technologies that are used. So we started thinking about this problem um, and trying to figure out whether we can get simultaneous information about both the um, paired heavy light chain sequences of the B cell receptor, so a given B cell at the single cell level, as well as the uh, antigens that this B cell can recognize. There are two major technologies or uh, two major platforms that um, we are using as part of this development um, process. On the one side is single cell BCR sequencing, which of course all of you uh, are familiar with. And on the other side is DNA barcoding, which I'm sure also uh, most, if not all of you are very familiar with. So the basic process um, of what um, the antigen specific uh, BCR, BCR sequencing involves is to start typically with antigen specific B cell sorting. So we have an antigen of interest we sort uh, for B cells that are reactive against this antigen, and then we use single cell solutions, such as um, in, in our case, we use 10X, of course, other uh, single cell solutions are out there um, and can be easily interchanged with the 10X platform. And then from there, we go to next generation sequencing to obtain information about the B cell receptors at the single cell level. 
on uh, the DNA bar barcode insight that has been done a lot, um, and typically that's being done with labeling antibodies against cell surface markers. And here's quite a few references that have utilized this technology. So we decided to combine the two technologies into something that we call LibreSeq. Um, and here's a, a simplified schematic of what LibreSeq represents. Basically, we take an antigen of interest, we label it with an oligo barcode. Uh, we also have a fluorophore for um, a sorting part of the, um, of the process that I'll describe shortly. And then we actually can do this for multiple different antigens at a time, mix them with B cells and uh, perform the uh, antibody sequence to antigen specificity mapping through sequencing experiment. There are five major steps in this process. So as I said, we start um, with mixing B cells with barcoded antigens in step one. Then we do an antigen specific B cell sorting step. During this step, what happens is that we've labeled the antigens with the same color. So all antigens are labeled with the same color. At this point, we do not know um, which antigen binds to which B cell. So we cannot distinguish between antigens, but we have selected for B cells that are specific to any of the antigens in our screening library. Then we move on to the single cell part of the um, process. And then uh, we perform next generation sequencing and bioinformatic analysis to extract antigen specificity information. And so here's your typical output from a LibreSeq experiment. So we get a large list of B cells um, with the paired heavy and light chain sequences for, for each of the B cells. And then um, for a given set of antigens, we get the antigen specificity scores. So in uh, this case, for example, we have um, a B cell that is reactive against these antigens here shown in red, but that is not reactive against the antigens shown in blue here. And basically what this represents is a high resolution antigen specificity map for a large number of B cells against a large number of antigens. So in, in theory, this is what LibreSeq um, does, and we wanted to test out whether the technology actually would work in practice. And the way we did this uh, was with two sets of experiments. One was to test against B cell lines with known BCR sequences and antigen specificity. And then the next step was to actually look at human infection samples and see whether we can uh, successfully identify B cells with the target antigen specificity. So the B cell line experiment, um, it was a pretty simple setup. Uh, we did this in collaboration with Daniel Lingwood's group at Raygon and Harvard. And the idea here is that we used two different B cell lines. One was um, what's called the BRCA1 uh, B cell line. And BRCA1, uh, I'm sure most of you know, is a very well-known HIV specific drug neutralizing antibody. And the other cell line was FE53, which is a broadly neutralizing antibody against influenza. So we had two cell lines, one was against HIV, one was against flu. And of course we wanted to add both HIV and flu antigens. And so we did two HIV antigens from two different diverse HIV strains, BG505, which is a clade A and CCA97, which is a clade C strain. And then we had one influenza um, hemagglutinin strain antigen that, that was used. And we mixed that with um, equal ratios of BRCA1 and FE53 B cell lines. So the idea here was to see whether we can recover B cells from those B cell lines and whether we could successfully identify the antigen specificity of these B cells. So this was one of the original ex LibreSeq experiments that we did. This was um, close to a couple of years ago now, um, I believe. But it was really exciting to see the, um, that we were able to recover around um, a couple of thousand B cells from this experiment. And uh, around 1,400 of them were VRCO1, and around 1,000 of them were the full specific, uh, full antibody, FAT53. And the other exciting part was that we were successfully able to discriminate between different types of antigen specificities. So what's shown here is, you may be familiar with this from um, pulse atometry uh, type experiments, 
Uh, but this is really um, Libre-seq scores that we have for different B cells, and this is um, colored by cell density. So the yellow color represents a big number of, uh, of cells within that um, part of space, and then going through red and then blue is a, a smaller number of cells. And you can see that um, in terms of trying to discriminate between the different specificities, we had a lot of cells that uh, had high score for the flu AHA antigen and low score for the uh, one of the HAV antigens, BG505, and vice versa. Uh, there were cells that had high scores for um, the HAV antigen and low scores for the flu antigens. And there were really virtually no B cells that had high scores for both antigens, um, which, which was um, exactly what we were hoping to see. Um, the same was true for the other HIV antigen compared to the, the flu antigen, either high on flu, low on HIV, or high on HIV, low on flu. So that was really exciting. And the other exciting part was that uh, when we look at the um, um, Lieber seed scores for the two HIV antigens shown on the X and Y axis here, you can see that most of the B cells that we identified from the VRCO1 B cell line um, actually have high scores for both. So um, this indicated that we can successfully identify B cells that are cross-reactive between multiple different variants um, from uh, the same uh, antigen type. And as I mentioned, VRCO1 is a broadly neutralizing antibody, and as such, we expect it to actually cross-react with multiple different variants of the HAV1 envelope uh, glycoprotein, which we used as an antigen here. Okay, so this was very encouraging, but of course, you know, working with B cell lines is not the same as working with primary cells. And so we next move on to moved on to analyze um, human infection samples. And I will highlight one of the, um, uh, the, the analysis that we did. So we looked at an HAV drug neutralizing um, chronic infection sample, and we used a nine antigen screening library. So we had five antigens that are shown here at the top, which were variants of the HAV envelope glycoprotein, and we had four uh, antigens that were variants of flu HA. And again, the sample here was um, a chronic HAV infection sample. So we expected that because everyone is exposed to flu, uh, either through vaccination or infection or you know both multiple times throughout their lifetime. So we expected to see some flu antibodies uh, or B cells as well in addition to the HIV specific B cells that we could recover. And that's why we used this um, antigen screening library. And this sample was obtained uh, from the group of Mark Connors at uh, NIAID. So um, one of the reasons we selected this particular uh, donor and sample was because previous work had identified the broadly neutralizing antibody lineage from this donor. This broadly neutralizing antibody lineage is called VRC38 and uh, is shown here. So multiple antibody variants from this lineage were identified uh, from this paper by um, Evan Kale uh, and, and John Mascola's group at the VRC and collaborators, of course. And so we wanted to ask two questions. One was, um, could we recover antibodies from this known broadly neutralizing antibody lineage? And the second question was, can we actually identify other BNAPs that uh, previous approaches may have missed from uh, this donor? So we applied LibreSeq with um, a variety of antigens, as I said, nine different antigens. Um, and then uh, we were able to recover around 1,500 um, B cells. So first we looked to compare to the known VRC38 um, antibody lineage and the uh, results are shown here. Previously known sequences are shown in black and uh, newly identified LibreSeq sequences are shown in red. And you can see that we have pretty good coverage of the um, VRC38 lineage, identifying uh, in some cases sequences that were actually uh, greater somatic hypermutation levels than um, what was previously identified. But the main point here is that we were successfully able to pull out um, VRC38 lineage members, and as expected, we did see cross-reactivity, although not against all of the different variants within 
this lineage. But we were still able to um, successfully identify these B cells as HIV specific cross reactive B cells. So that confirmed that liver seek can be used successfully to identify antibodies from known lineages. But then the next question was can we identify antibodies from novel lineages that potentially have greater neutralization breadth? And so the way we did this was to look at the cross reactivity um, antigen specificity map that was generated by LibreSeq. And so what's shown here is the frequency of um, B cells that were observed with different types of antigen specificity. And so on the leftmost column here, for example, you can see the number of B cells that were identified to have specificity, specificity only against the ZM197 HIV variant. Um, and you had a bunch of those, what we call type specific B cells that were only specific to one antigen variant. And then we had a number of B cells that were specific to several different antigen variants, which are shown on the right here. So for example, there were 33 B cells that were specific to all five, or that could recognize to all five different HIV antigens that were used in our screening library. So um, with that in mind, we wanted to focus on these cross-reactive B cells as potential targets for the identification of novel broadly neutralizing antibodies. And when we did that, um, we started making some of these antibodies and I'm gonna highlight one of these antibodies here, which is called 3602-870 that we selected for antigen, um, for, um, making as monoclonal antibody and then testing it in various assays to confirm its antigen specificity. And then we also selected one additional antigen um, antibody that was called 3602-1707 that was cross-reactive against several different um, flu variants. We made these antibodies in the lab and we tested them initially in, uh, by ELISA for binding to the antigens of interest. And we confirmed as expected that the 870 antibody successfully bound to um, the different HIV antigens and the flu antibody bound to the flu antigens, but not the other way around. So the HIV antibody uh, as predicted was not flu specific and the flu antibody as predicted was not um, HIV specific. And there was a pretty good correlation between the Lieber seq scores and the ELISA area under the curve, which is shown here as a heat map although of course uh, the correlation uh, was not perfect. So then we tested this antibody for neutralization against a reference global panel of um, HIV variants. And this work was performed uh, in the group of Lynn Morris at NICD in South Africa. And you can see the comparison of our antibody 3602-870 against um, the, one of the VRC38 variants BRC3801. And as you can see here, so this is a, a heat map of neutralization. White represents no neutralization. Dark red represents really potent neutralization against tier two viruses. You can see the substantial increased neutralization breadth of our antibody 3602-870 compared to the other drug neutralizing lineage BRC3801. And I would say I should say that these antibody lineages are completely different using uh, very different B genes and, and so on. So they have no relationship to each other. So this indicated that we can successfully actually identify antibodies that have greater neutralization breadth um, that were missed by previous methods analyzing this particular donor. The other point that I want to make is that we also looked at additional uh, antibodies from additional um, donors. And so what's shown here, what's shown here is um, a summary of antibodies that we looked at from a, a different HIV infected donor. And um, as um, was uh, predicted by the LibreSeq technology, we were successfully able to identify their antigen specificity um, and that was confirmed by uh, ELISA binding for both the HIV antibodies on top here and the flu antibodies on bottom here. So we had pretty good correlation between what we predicted would be the antigen specificity of these antibodies and um, the actual antigen specificity. So at this point, we're pretty happy with, with these results. And 
basically um, as, as an initial validation of the LibreSeq technology that you can start using a lot of different antigens. As I said, we went up to nine antigens in this experiment. We have gone up to a, a lot more since then, unfortunately, because of um, IP issues and, uh, and, and the fact that these all of these slides are being uh, posted online. I, I cannot show you some of the uh, recent data, but hopefully you can get excited about the type of work that we can do with the LibreSeq technology. Um, and, the, uh, and I'm happy to talk about potential collaborations. So this part of the work was um, led by two graduate students in the lab, Ian Sutliff, who is now a scientist at Regeneron, and Andrea Shakolas, who I believe is on this call right now, and she's about to graduate and we'll be looking for um, exciting postdoc opportunities. So I, um, I cannot uh, speak highly enough of the, uh, of the amazing work that both these students um, have done with uh, the LibreSeq development. Uh, all right, so next I wanted to show some unpublished data that we have um, that relates to coronavirus antibody work. And this was work again, that was done at the beginning um, starting around March. We have some um, newer results, um, but I think this is a good representation of the type of analysis that you can do with the LibreSeq technology and the potential usefulness. And so what we did here was we um, took a number of different uh, variants from uh, the coronavirus, beta coronavirus, uh, coronaviruses, and we looked at SARS-2, SARS-1, MERS, uh, OC43, and HKU, um, and as well as we added a couple of um, HAV antigens as controls. This was a donor that had been infected with SARS-1, so not SARS-2, but SARS-1, and uh, the sample was collected around uh, more than 10 years after infection. So we weren't too um, confident that we we're going to discover any cells of interest from this donor, but that, that was what was accessible to us at the time. And I think we still were able to identify some really cool antibodies that I'm gonna show you next. So this sample was obtained in collaboration with uh, Barney Graham's group at also at the BRC uh, NIH. And antigens from the coronaviruses were obtained in collaboration with Jason McClellan at UT Austin. So we ran LibreSeq and we identified a number of different B cells that had interesting cross-reactivity. We made some of them and I'm showing you some of the binding results here. Um, so th these are ELISA data. On top left here is binding to SARS-CoV-2 S protein, stabilizing the prefusion conformation um, and different curves represent different antibodies with VRCO1 shown in black. That's an HIV control, so it's flat everywhere. And uh, 240CD coronavirus, non-coronavirus antibody as a positive control. And you can see that um, a, a bunch of our antibodies that we identified with the 46472 nomenclature are shown in different colors. You can see that all of these antibodies that I'm showing here are reactive with SARS-CoV-2-S, even though, uh, again, this was a donor that had never seen SARS-CoV-2. Um, this donor was infected with SARS-CoV-1 a long time before sample collection. Uh, we do see good reactivity with SARS-CoV-1 for the same antibodies. And we also actually see some cross-reactivity with a few, uh, some of the endemic coronaviruses, OC43 shown here and HKU1 shown here. So this was very exciting um, to see, and this data is summarized as a heat map of area under the curve on this slide here. So you can see that these antibodies, really strong cross-reactivity with SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, as well as some cross-reactivity with OC43 and HKU1. And we actually have some evidence that at least some of these antibodies are also binding um, MERS-S, which is pretty exciting as well. Um, but we uh, do not have definitive confirmation of these results yet, so I'm not showing them here. Then we wanted to ask um, whether all of these antibodies targeted the same binding site, the same epitope on the S protein, or whether um, you know they could target different epitopes. And so we did epitope mapping by binding to um, the different subunits S1 and S2, shown here. This is ELISA area under the curve data. Um, Darker colors mean, of course, better binding. And so you can see that two of the antibodies recognized S1, 
four of the antibodies recognized S2, and all of them recognized the full spike. And then within S1, um, I'm sure many of you by now know that um, this region can be divided in several uh, domains. One is the receptor binding domain, which includes the ACE2 receptor um, binding site, as well as the N-terminal domain, which is called NTD that's shown in cyan and here. And you can see that one of our antibodies is actually um, targeting the receptor binding domain in magenta, and one of the antibodies is targeting the um, cyan domain that's shown here. So this indicated that we have a diverse set of uh, antibodies that uh, could target cross-reactive epitopes. And probably at this point, um, the most interesting ones would be these S2 antibodies, which have not been as well studied as some of the other RBD antibodies, for example, are, are um, extremely well studied by now. So then we asked whether these antibodies um, can show any functional activity against the virus. And we did not see any neutralization, but we saw several different FC effector functions. What's shown here is phagocytosis. So higher bars indicate um, greater ADCP or uh, antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis. So um, for example, the control palivizumab antibody, there's very little activity. There's basically no uh, activity, but then we have positive control known coronavirus antibody, uh, CR3022 shown here. And then these are our antibodies here. And then you can see that they have pretty good reactivity, especially uh, uh, antibody 12. And that's true for both uh, SARS-CoV-2 as well as SARS-CoV-1. So they have FC effector functions against both of these um, viruses. We also did um, ADCT, which is uh, antibody dependent cellular trophocytosis with surface, uh, cell surface expressed antigen. And uh, we also saw really good signals for some of the antibodies. And this was work performed in collaboration with, again, the group of Lynn Morris in South Africa. So then we wanted to see whether there are any in vivo effects um, using these antibodies. And we did this in collaboration with a group of Ralph um, Barrick at UNC Chapel Hill. So the study here was basically a very stringent infection model. These were very old mice, 12 month old mice and very high dosage of virus 10 to the fourth of uh, mouse adapted SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, anybody, this was a prophylaxis model, so anybody was administered at day minus one, challenge at day zero, and then follow um, the development of disease up to day four, at which point tissue was collected. So um, we didn't see differences in viral loads per se, but we observed some differences, although not significant, statistically significant differences. At uh, in terms of survival, so um, antibody 12 in particular showed better survival rate than the other antibodies in this group, but again, uh, in, in the study, but um, again, um, there was no statistical significance. And the, the very interesting point about this in vivo study was that when uh, hemorrhage scores were computed, which is basically looking at um, hemorrhage within the lung, for both of our uh, antibodies number four and number 12, the scores were much lower, significantly lower compared to a negative control antibody, which was a dengue antibody here, as well as a positive control antibody, CR3022, for the surviving animals. So there are some in vivo effects that uh, we're not clear on exactly why they happen, but it seems like these antibodies uh, can actually impact pathological burden in vivo. So in, to summarize this part of the study, we use LibreSeq to identify a set of cross-reactive SARS-1, SARS-2 antibodies. Um, they had diverse specificities indicating that there are multiple cross-reactive epitopes on S, which can actually be used as potential vaccine templates for the design of pan coronavirus or broadly reactive coronavirus vaccines. Uh, these antibodies are non-neutralizing, but have FC effector functions and potential in vivo functions. And this part of the study was led again by Andrea, um, and Kevin Kramer, who is another graduate student in the lab, who is also about to graduate and will be looking for postdoctoral opportunities. So with this, I'd like to wrap up, thank all of our collaborators. This has been an immense amount of work over the last couple of years, both in terms of technology development and then trying to apply this technology to various targets. As I said, I can't show you some of the newer results that we have that are exciting, but hopefully you get excited about 
um, the type of work that um, in, uh, the, the results that I showed you um, are, are indicating we can do with this technology. And I'm happy to think about and talk about collaborations. And I also would like to uh, say for the uh, more junior people in the audience that we're always looking for um, new um, people who are excited about this type of work to join our group. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much for that excellent talk, Evelyn. Uh, we do have a couple minutes. We can probably fit in a couple questions here. We have one from Johannes um, asking, how frequent are these antigen-specific B cells in peripheral blood? Um, basically, um, how much blood do you need in order to be able to identify these? And I believe this was specifically in the context of the uh, corona samples. Yeah, absolutely. So the the level of frequency would depend on the antigens, it seems. Um, you know, when you're looking at chronic infection, that may be very different from um, what you see with, you know, acute infection or something that happened many, many years ago. We typically see somewhere on the order of 1% antigen-specific B cells. Um, and in the specific case of coronavirus, for this particular sample, we started with 10, 20 million PBMCs, and we were still able to recover um, several hundred um, antigen-specific B cells. So that, that is a good indication that, you know, obviously if you start with 50 million or if you start with even more than that, you will be able to recover a lot more B cells. But um, we are able to uh, use a reasonable amount of, of uh, starting material in terms of feasibility, I think. Uh, we have another question uh, from Jamie. Um, was wondering how the Libra score seek score is calculated. Absolutely. So the Libra seek scores are a function of um, the unique molecular identifier counts that we see. Um, from the sequencing experiment, but we do perform several transformations to account for various variables that the UMIs may be, may be affected by, such as, um, you know, different B cells or different um, loading of barcode on antigen um, and, and, and things like that. So we do several transformations, both row-wise and column-wise, so both with respect to um, each antigen as well as with respect to uh, at the B cell level. And this is all described in our paper, but I'm happy to provide more details um, later as well. Uh, there's another question from Eric um, asking whether or not a similar approach could be applied to T cells. Yeah, and I do believe that similar approaches are actually available. Um, some of them are actually available commercially through 10x where you can um, do some T cell epitope mapping at the same time at, at, as the sequencing. Of course, T cells and B cells are very different. So there is a lot of differences in the way uh, the experiment has to be set up when you're dealing with antigens that are very conformationally sensitive and much more complex than uh, the T epitopes recognized by T cells. But there have been several approaches that have been proposed and utilized for T cells as well. Are there restrictions on the kind of antigens that you can tag, size restrictions or anything like that? There are size restrictions. Um, the kits that we use, um, I don't know the exact numbers, but there is a size restriction on, on both ends. The coronavirus S protein is, is uh, extremely large. So that's um, you know a good indication that we can handle a lot of, um, of different types of antigens, but Yes, for example, if you're looking at uh, something that's a VLP, then different approaches can be utilized rather than the, the, bar, the specific barcoding technology that I described here. And we're currently exploring these uh, different approaches to allow for the, um, the use of many different types of antigens other than recombinant soluble antigens. Sort of related to the earlier question about the TCR dextromer uh, approach. Um, Katerina is wondering if there are any plans to combine this with um, transcriptomics to study the phenotype at the same time. Yes, absolutely. And we have done uh, some of that already. It's not published yet. We do see some interesting trends between uh, transcriptomics data and antigen specificity data and uh, B cell receptor sequencing data. So that is something that we're actively exploring currently. Um, Andre has a question. 
about whether or not you think this approach would be helpful using yeast display libraries. And have you tried something like that? I, uh, <laughs> that's a great question. So we are, um, we're working on that right now. Uh, yeast display libraries are uh, a way to allow for much more high throughput antigen generation. And we're actively working in that direction because um, of course, producing some of these antigens, especially, you know, when you look at HAV envelope protein, um, that can be very challenging and it, it takes a while to do. And so you can probably do several dozen at a time, but you cannot get into the hundreds, for example, or not very easily. And so we're working, Ease Display is one solution that we're looking into right now for uh, such high throughput um, screening of antigens. So there's three more questions in the queue, but we're about five minutes over. So I will, uh, I'll just do, I'll pull one more, first come, first serve. Um, Katarina asks, what's the minimum affinity for um, antigen binding in order to get picked up by this approach? Do you know? That, that's an excellent question. And I think that we are, our approach is actually very sensitive because we're using B cells instead of, you know, monoclonal antibodies. And especially in the case of um, IgM B cells, the affinity may not be that great and we're still able to pick out IgM B cells that are antigen specific. So I do not have a specific number that I can cite. And I think it would depend on many different factors. Um, but it, it does look like that uh, it, even with very low affinity, we can still pick up some B cells that are antigen specific. All right, thank you. Um, maybe we can follow up with the remaining questions on chat in the interest of moving forward on time. That sounds great, thank you.